This is Star Talk. I'm here from Star Talk Radio with Katie Coleman. Thanks for taking time to chat with us sure. today. So our fans actually sent in some questions, and I'm going to ask them. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. So um, the first question. What sort of day-to-day -day roles do astronauts have in the preparation and planning of current human spaceflight operations? We have a little finger in every pie that is involved in sending humans to space. And so that means for the space station, you know, we've got people who are, you know, working on training and trying to make sure that astronauts are being trained in a way that astronauts think they should be trained. We're not in charge of training, but we've got, you know, an eye in there. And, for example, my job in supply ships, making sure that the people on board the space station understand what's going on on the ground, and that the people on the ground, you know, it's SpaceX and Orbital Sciences and our, our friends in Japan, that they understand what life is like for the crew when they're trying to grab that school bus sized thing. So we're, we're always involved, I would say, in every aspect of human spaceflight. And that includes tomorrow's flight of Orion, the first flight where we have had astronauts assigned to Orion, helping engineers when they're trying to decide, you know, is this necessary? Can we get rid of this? You know, which things can we, which things are really necessary? Those are our astronaut representatives and they bring those questions back to the astronaut office and we talk about them. And we talk about the pros and the cons and, and what's, what's too important to give up. And, and so we're, we're involved in the whole, the whole deal. Truly interactive. It's absolutely so. Never ends, right? Thank you. Okay, um, our next question, uh, what do you think is the biggest hurdle toward establishing a permanent human presence in space? Money. Well, seriously, you know, it really, the things that we're doing, in order to do them safely, it's really expensive. And, and we also have, a, I think, a fairly risk-averse society right now where people want to see success after success when things like this where you're really tackling the unknown. I mean, if you are totally successful all the time, it's probably not the unknown. But we are tackling the unknown, and, the thing, and, and we're making sure that we basically have a safe path to the moon, asteroids, and Mars in a vehicle that people can voyage out into the solar system, live other places eventually. It'll happen, but it takes a lot of money, and it takes a lot of passion. Space is never routine. Space is not over to Thank you. Okay, um, what was the most unusual experiment sent up to the ISS to be done in microgravity? Actually, can I answer question number two again? Absolutely. So, you know, I was being kind of flip and I said money. And it's true. But it, it's actually more practical than that, too. It's technology. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say we're ready to go to Mars, but we're not. We have steps that we need to take, and we are taking them. You know, we need propulsion that will get us there in a reasonable amount of time. We need life support systems that are going to be able to recycle the air. We can't bring it all with us and the water and our supplies. So we need those things and we're working on them right now. Testing solar array panels to and understand how to have more energy for solar electric power. Um, there's all sorts, of, all sorts of things that we need for technology. We're researching those things and eventually we'll have them and we'll be ready to go. Thank you so much. Um, most unusual experiment that you know of sent up to the ISS to be done in microgravity? I guess I think of the experiments that we do ourselves up mm -hmm. there as the ones that might be considered the most unusual. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, you know, sometimes just with your food. You know, the, the games that we play, the games that we're, we make up as we spend time up there and enjoy each other's <laughs> company. And those things all have implications for processing here on the ground, for understanding what we can really do in space and what we can't, for understanding some physics that are a little bit unexpected. Mm. So I think that everything can be an experiment, and that's why it's pretty delightful to be up there. Do you have a food example? We've seen the M&Ms flying around. We've seen the globs of liquid. Anything come to mind? Well, the most deadly example is barbecue sauce. I mean, well, seriously, when you're trying to learn how to eat, and so you, you know, you're very carefully, you know, having your barbecue beef, and uh, and then you know, just with that last spoonful, you lose your focus and a little bit, of, you lose your concentration, and and 
to sort of flip that spoon in that little glob of barbecue sauce is like a homing pigeon and it goes straight <laughs> for your crewmate's brand new shirt of which they only have six of. It happens. Wow. You're on earth too, but not quite the same way. Um, okay, what immediate and long-term benefits do you expect from manufacturing in space? We know a 3D printer just went up there and any thoughts about that? I like to think about benchmark examples. Things that, that we can't make here on the ground yet. In the field of semiconductors, looking at how, do we, how can we form different crystals with different mixtures where on the ground there's a sedimentation process that really dominates. And so we can't really see what are the limits or what are the heights of semiconductor crystals that we could achieve. The same for any kind of crystal sort of design. Um, metal alloys. What do we look around and find that is made of metal? What does metal do for us? Most everything that is able to be sort of sustainable and repeatable, you know, equipment that's used a lot, metal is a big deal. And being able to have stronger, lighter metals mm -hmm. are, is important for a lot of applications down here on Earth. And also going to space, less weight to get to orbit. Very good. Thank you. Okay, um, Scott Kelly is going to be undergoing a 12-month space mission. I know you were up there for six. Um, does he have to train differently for that duration? And are there concerns beyond those we have for astronauts currently up in space for shorter durations? Part of the reason to send people like Scott um, is that we want him, we want someone to go for a year and we want to understand what are those differences. Mm -hmm. We've been noticing some risks to being up there and we need to understand, you know, are they something that just happens? You know, we've, we've seen some increases in intercranial, inter intercranial um, and so, is that something that happens right when you get up there and it stays constant? Does it happen to everybody? Um, is it something that gets worse and worse and worse over a long duration? Right now, our data is limited to between three and six months. And it's not really long enough to be able to use as our basis for sending people further. So on purpose, we're sending Scott a little bit into the unknown to understand you know, what happens to him as a person. And I think that it involves psychology as well. When you asked if anything would be any different for training, right. I think it's important to set your expectations reasonably, to really realize ahead of time that you will be, um, you know, up there for a while and have limited kinds of communication. And how are you going to prepare for that in advance? Right. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to um, end up with this question. Okay. Um, if you were offered a one-year mission, would you go? And would you be up for a Mars mission? I would go for a one-year mission in a moment. I mean, if Scott got sick tomorrow, I would be in his shoes. And so many of us would. You know, we, we spend a lot of time getting ready, making sure we know all the things that we need to know to be resources up there on that space station. And once you have all those tools, I think the, the passion that we have for moving the marker forward, for learning more up there, all of us would like to be that person and help learn those things. And I'd love to live there, and I figure Earth will still be here when I get home. Wonderful. How about Mars? And Mars I would do. Would you? It's probably easier for me to say that knowing probably it's going to be folks from the younger generation that are going to be the ones to go. So it might be a little easier for me to say that, but I'd go. Well, this goes out to all the friends and fans of Star Talk Radio. I love it that there's a whole group of people listening at the same time, and they're all passionate about what we see when we look up. So keep looking up.